Good morning, everybody. It is Monday, March 18th. Welcome to the Transportation and Environment Committee. Uh, we have three items on our agenda for this morning. The first is a discussion, part of our ongoing uh, conversations about building energy performance standards and the industries uh, here in Montgomery County. Uh, and the first, uh, the, this is the third uh, of our series of conversations. And, and today's conversation will be with our life sciences and biotech sector. After that, we have a conversation about Executive Regulation 124, the incentive program for electric leaf blower removal equipment. Uh, and then the third item is a wrap up on our CIP projects for the Transportation and Environment Committee. Um, so first item is the BEPS conversation. Um, I see Mr. Halpert, where are you? You want to? Come on up, sir. And I see Ms. Schultz is on Zoom. Um, as I noted, this is the third in our conversations as we as a committee and we as a council work to implement the Building Energy Performance Standards Law that was passed a few years ago. Uh, we all remain committed to uh, improving our building efficiencies so that we can reduce our carbon emissions. Uh, but as we know, uh, each not every building is the same. And we have some very important sectors here in the county uh, uh, whose impacts would be um, would, would differ. Uh, the first conversation we had was with our hospitals and healthcare systems. The second conversation we had was with our affordable housing providers. And the third conversation, which we are having this morning, is with our life sciences and biotech sector. And the reason that is incredibly important is because Montgomery County itself is the third largest bio hub in the entire country. Not the DC region, but Montgomery County itself. And so we have had, uh, I have had a number of conversations with sector leaders uh, and very much uh, appreciate um, uh, those who are here today. Uh, Ms. Kelly Schultz, the CEO of the Maryland Tech Council, joining us virtually, uh, and Avi Halpert, who is Vice President of Government and Community Affairs at United Therapeutics. Uh, Mr. Levchenko, do you have anything else you'd like to add on this item before we hop in? I think you summed it up quite well. Councilmember Balcom? No, I'm good. Thank you. OK. Um, first, I'll turn it over to, to Ms. Schultz, who we see, and I trust we will be able to hear in a few seconds. I trust you can as well. We, and we do. There you go. Uh, it's a good Monday. <laughs> there we go. Uh, there Standards proposed in the draft regulations. 
we urge Montgomery County to consider the uniqueness of the life sciences industry as it works to finalize these regulations. The Maryland General Assembly recognized this when it passed the Climate Solutions Now Act in 2022. That law required that the state, as necessary, as necessary include special provisions or exceptions to account for the unique needs of particular building or occupancy types, including healthcare facilities, laboratories, assisted living and nursing facilities, military buildings, critical infrastructure, and buildings used in life sciences as defined in section 3-201 of the Economic Development Article. We highly recommend that Montgomery County adopt the similar provision that the state has adopted because of the unique energy demands of the life science industry. At a minimum, we encourage Montgomery County to specifically engage the life sciences community as you are now to really determine the unique characteristics of the critical industry. I thank you again, uh, Mr. Chairman, for being able to be here. Happy to answer any questions along the way. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ms. Schultz. Now we'll turn it over to Mr. Halpert. Thank you. Uh, uh, Council Vice President Stewart is currently traveling with the county executive. There we go. Put it on. Hey, uh, good morning and thank you, Chair Glass and Council Member uh, Balcombe and members of the Maryland Department of Environmental Protection sitting behind me. Uh, my name is Avi Halpert. I'm the Vice President of Government Affairs and Community Relations at United Therapeutics. Prior to this position and for 17 and a half years, I headed up the real estate and construction group at United Therapeutics, developing not only our campus in downtown Silver Spring, but over a billion dollars of administrative manufacturing research and development and warehousing throughout North America, UK and EU. Uh, I am here today on behalf of the life science industry in Montgomery County to share with you that the 400 plus life science firms, which employ tens of thousands of employees, which help make the state of Maryland the third largest bio life science hub in the United States that we all, we all want to keep. We want to do the right thing and we want to save lives. UT CEO Dr. Martine Rothblatt said that our mission is to save lives and we cannot do so without negatively impacting the environment. This was the mission when we that we were challenged with when we built the Unisphere, the largest urban site net zero building in the United States. We used existing technology at the time to construct this amazing testament to sustainability, but had to change regulations at the state level to allow for geothermal wells to be constructed under the footprint of the building. The Maryland Department of Environment, Environmental Protection had tried for over seven years to change the regulations. It took a state agency, several lobbyists, and a determined life science company to make this happen. Change takes time. I commend Montgomery County for all the initiatives and sustainability it has already implemented and those it plans to implement. But I am here today to tell you that the life science industry as a whole is not capable of adhering to the proposed regulations as outlined in the BEPS. Uh, it is not because we don't want to adopt these standards, it's because the industry hasn't fully adopted to the electrification of the equipment necessary to make this happen. I was part of a real estate team that executed on the needs of our technical operations group, manufacturing, research and development, and facilities and engineering teams at United Therapeutics. In preparation for my testimony today, I engage with these groups as well as outside design teams, our general contractor, as well as manufacturers of equipment who shared with me the industry is not currently capable of full electrification. According to one of our designers, while basic support labs for the life science industry are perhaps capable of the transition, scalable R&D in manufacturing is not ready for the jump to an all electric world. While some of the backbone components of our manufacturing process are beginning to test smaller electric boilers, for example, 
the ability to find local service technicians who do not have to be flown in from the Midwest or other areas is still an issue. Switching an existing natural gas system to electric in an existing building would also require upgrades to the electric service and gear with rippling effects to the emergency generator and switch gear. To make the full transition to electricity, you would have to redesign your central utility plant or switch to a plant steam operation to serve all the new electrified equipment. <clears throat> One of our general contractor mechanical engineers stated that lab pharma facilities are energy intensive due to the requirements for greater changes and other thermal demands by lab programming. Uh, the report in front of you goes into greater detail. Electrification of the thermal process would have the following implications. Increased operating costs, increased capacity of emergency backup system, and create a public utility strain. <clears throat> From one of United Therapeutics Associate Directors of Process Engineering, Electrification of existing buildings under normal operation will require substantial downtime of facilities making critical pharmaceuticals potentially leading to drug shortages. Improvements to the power grid will also be required. Additional space for increased electrical switching and distribution may be prohibitive in some cases. Go into greater detail about all of the opportunities that United Therapeutics as a company has explored in trying to be more sustainable as well as look at other uh, alternatives. <clears throat> we have a thriving life science community in Montgomery County, Maryland. I'm here today because I have the luxury to monitor legislation at the state, county, and municipal le level. Most of the startup and mid-side life science firms are focused on their research, their drug trials, or raising their next round of funding to keep the lights on, pay the staff salaries, and buy consumables to conduct their life-saving research. Many don't own the facilities and are relying on their landlords to monitor legislation. These firms, as they grow and scale, will seek out locations where the economics of expansion and building or retrofitting new facilities make the most economic sense. Over 800 firms are members of the Maryland Tech Council, who uh, is represented by, by Kelly, who gave uh, testimony today and shared some of the same concerns. United Therapeutics is a bit of an anomaly. We have tested the limits of sustainability, and in North Carolina, where we have the land, have built a cold storage logistics facility where we have two Tesla mega packs as emergency backup at a cost of several million dollars, having the necessary land, helping enact changes at permitting, inspections, zoning, and with the assistance of Duke Power, we made electrification work in this case. But most companies or landlords cannot afford to prove out this opportunity in, electri in electrification. We are all about saving the environment and at the same time saving lives. We need to do so in a thoughtful manner which allows the industry and the infrastructure time to adapt. Thank you for your dedication to the environment and the people of Montgomery County and allowing me the opportunity to present this morning. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Mr. Halpert. Uh, I have uh, a question or two for each of you uh, before I turn it over to, to Councilmember Balcom. Uh, Ms. Schultz. Uh, from from your perspective, uh, uh, curious if you're following the state conversation, right? And uh, that Mr. Halpert alluded to with this with the state regs, uh, and what you and your members think about the state regs versus uh, the the county regs. Yeah. So the Maryland Tech Council did provide written testimony to the state as well when they were going through the regulatory process and to make sure that life sciences was written in as one of the industries that needed to take into consideration for exceptions when it comes to that, similar to, like you had mentioned before, the hospitals. Um, so we've been very active in that and following up our guidance. Very good. Uh, and Mr. Halpert, you, you mentioned uh, monitoring the state as well. Do you have any additional thoughts 
No, I mean, they're, they're beginning to come out with, uh, with the regulations. Um, with, with Kelly and others in the industry, we're watching closely. And again, if we can create a compatible uh, regulation uh, and legislation when it comes to the implementation of it for life sciences, I think the message will be clear both at the state level and the county level. Trying to reconcile two levels of, of regulations is a bit confusing for, for the industry. And I think when, when site selection people come and look at the state of Maryland and start drilling down into uh, the, the pros and the cons, um, you know, energy regulations uh, will, will be first and foremost in addition to the availability of talent and uh, good water sources and other criteria that are typically looked at. But again, maintaining consistency, I think, is super important. Uh, thank you. Uh, the, the other question I have for you, uh, Mr. Halpert, you uh, mentioned the, the groundbreaking work, literally and figuratively, that UT has done in Montgomery County and downtown Silver Spring. Uh, and you also alluded to the uh, complications that going all electric or this move in that direction eventually would pose for smaller and, and mid-size uh, companies. Can you uh, break down a little bit more uh, what those different needs are? Uh, you, you, you've alluded to it, but, but can you speak to it in, in any um, specificity about the, the lab, about the equipment? Yeah, there, there's numerous uh, uh, components within within the laboratory. There's uh, there's um, sterilization and sanitation equipment, um, autoclaves, part washers, uh, systems that that kill uh, the the waste before it gets put back into the environment. Um, these are the, the backbone of these systems uh, typically require um, boiler systems, natural gas uh, boiler systems in order to efficiently operate them. Um, there are companies, and, and we've done some research, and I've also provided you uh, a rep a. Uh, a a report by one of our in-house engineers titled Decarbonization Biotech Facilities, Practical Considerations for Strategic Planning. It talks about the cost associated. It talks about the equipment necessary. It talks about the opportunities to happen. And again, the opportunities are there. Uh, can it be designed into a system? Yes. Um, in an urban environment such as uh, Silver Spring, we looked into uh, a battery system and because of flammability, because of proximity to residential, because of proximity uh, to multifamily, we could not achieve it in, in an urban environment. Is it easier to do it? In a green field out 270, yes. Is it costly? Yes. Will will people in this current environment, landlords and developers, will they uh, will they consider this in their formula uh, as they decide to develop and continue to expand the life science industry here? It, it's getting expensive to do it. Supply chain is still a bit of a fiasco in our industry. We, you know, we are placing orders 24 to 36 months in advance for certain piece of a, pieces of equipment that currently only rely on natural gas to, uh, to, uh, to operate efficiently and effectively. Um, I don't know if I've answered. Yeah, no, I uh, appreciate that response. Uh, I have some other questions, but I'll turn it over to Councilmember Balcom. Um, thank you. Thank you for being here today, and thank you, Ms. Schultz, for coming. Uh, we've we've had these conversations with uh, with the life science uh, firms. Um, I had a recent conversation with AstraZeneca with similar uh, concerns. So appreciate you being here. Uh, just a couple. Comments, questions. Uh, I think this situation, you know, we're in this uh, te technology um, uh, 
a chicken and the egg, right? So we, we want to uh, increase uh, standards. The technology is not there. Uh, new buildings come online with new technology, but then the standards change. And so I think that um, we're, we're, you know, we're trying to uh, m move these two systems at the same time, and, and I think we're having a, a, a little glitch here. Um, so I appreciate the issue uh, about state versus county regulations, and um, I don't know if staff wanted to come up and talk about, did we, when, when in creating the law, the law came along before me, and, and in writing the regs, did we look at what the state was going to do or anticipate that? Uh, I don't know, uh, Mr. Edwards, if you wanted to come in on that. If you're the right person, I think you are. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm the right person either, but I'm Stan Edwards with the Department of Environmental Protection, and I have my colleagues Lindsay Shaw and, and Emily Curley who can come up as well. Um, we have been in constant contact with the state. It's been a bit of a back and forth about who's doing what and, and the timing of things, and we continue to engage in that. It will continue to engage in that. They're, as you know, in a bit of a pause, a hold, as they called it. Um, we have been in touch with them regularly to try to figure out if they know the outcome of, or the process by which that hold will be uh, unstuck. And th the folks we're talking to don't know it at this time. So uh, we expect that's something that's obviously going to be very important to all of us to figure out because we don't want to have duplicate sets of processes and regulations either. So. Sure. And the, the uh, exemption, not exemptions, but um, exceptions, I'll say, um, with, for hospitals, uh, biohealth, life science, a couple of the other uh, um, exceptions that Ms. Schultz mentioned. Have you looked at that and how that would fit w in Montgomery County? Well, I think we have. I, I'd like to ask Emily to come up. She's, yes, she's uh, much more down into the details of the, of the standards for the various uh, property types. Hi, Emily Carley, also with DEP. Um, so there is an exemption for uh, industrial uses and manufacturing. So for a building where 50% or more of the gross floor area is for manufacturing uses, and I'll have to check on all the details of what that says. But um, so essentially a lot of the um, kind of majority manufacturing facilities, which would include uh, pharmaceutical manufacturing, so there's a uh, provision in the county code that talks to which, like, what is manufacturing. Um, so for some facilities, they would just be exempted from the law. However, we too have talked to AstraZeneca. I think the challenge is with more mixed-use buildings where maybe a third of the building is lab, there's office, and so we've tried to accommodate that by, you know, having this concept of a area-weighted target, so if you have some lab space, some office space, you get a kind of combo target standard based on your, your uh, floor area. Um, in terms of state regulations, I'll just add that um, I think in attempting to um, address some of the complexity, a few things that the county's regulations have that the states do not um, are the concept of the Building Performance Improvement Plan, which we've talked about a bit, so if you are not uh, able technically or economically to meet that standard. We have this alternative path through the Building Performance Improvement Plan um, and allowing for a renewable energy allowance. So again, um, I think for, for some facilities that may help, um, for others that are you know in denser areas, it, it's still a challenge. But um, And our site energy use intensity targets as proposed are the same as what the state has proposed for lab buildings. Um, so to the extent that alignment is possible, we're, we're trying. Thank you. One, other, one other thing I'd point out, Ms. Balcom, is that uh, not all buildings, as we've talked about many times, not all buildings are the same, or no building is the same, I guess I'd say it. And one of the things that will impact how we can regulate particular buildings is the way they meter their various uses. Mm -hmm. So there could be options to... Um, and I'd have to go back and look at the law about whether we'd have to amend the law or whether the regulations would allow us to do this, but depending upon how 
the building is metered, you know, some uses the law would apply to and some uses it wouldn't, and uh, sort of gets to the things that, that Emily was talking about, about uh, what part of the building is manufacturing space or process mm -hmm. space as opposed to what part of the building is office space. Okay, thank you. Um, it, that's very helpful. Uh, <clears throat> the, other, the other question, and um, uh, Mr. Halpert, you might be able to answer this. Oh, probably all of you will. Um, <clears throat> what, are there areas in the United States or throughout the world that are doing this already? And what technologies are they doing that, that are different? Looking at Cal, I'm, I'm staring at you, Kelly, hoping, hoping you have your magic wand. Uh, um. Well, the, the, what I will say about that is I know that the laws that passed in Maryland in 2022 were the highest standards of any of the states, right? So now we're getting down to the law has passed and we're working into the regulatory process. Um, so I believe we are in somewhat uncharted territory when it comes to this, at least on the side of the country. But with that, I will say, you know, we are leading the force in wanting to make sure that we protect our environment and we are concentrated and focused on our climate that is a direct result of that. And we also, at the same time, have to understand the revenues and possible lack thereof that comes into the state. We are dramatically different than other states that are competing for the same types of business. Um, so where I see this is at an environmental level, also being able to support in a very conscientious way the businesses that are here already and helping them to go into a change to address the state needs um, and then to add on top of that to continue um, our mission, which I think is also a mission of Montgomery County, which is to remain the top three um, environments and ecosystems in the country for life science companies who are every day changing lives, saving lives, and you know creating innovative practices. So understanding the difficulty and managing both of those, um, I think for Maryland we are in a unique opportunity right now, and I, I, I'm happy to answer any additional questions. But you know we did a study. Um, four years ago for the state of Maryland, it's called the Milken Report by the Milken Institute, and it gave us a, a really good understanding of where we are and where we pretend to go in the future in life science industries in general in Maryland. We are making strides, but we're making a lot less strides than other cities and other states across the, com across the country because they are working with the industry to be able to create a friendly environment for these businesses to want to grow and to expand and even retain, right? So those are the three major initiatives that we're looking at. Mm, thank you. That, that helps. I think um, my, um, my phrase of the year is going to be conflicting priorities, right? Um, so I appreciate that, uh, that balance. So I just wanted to, um, Mr. Halpert, you might be able to uh, look at this. So there are some aspects. So I'm looking at whether the technology is feasible versus whether it's fe just actually can it occur versus um, feasible, but the cost, it's cost prohibitive. Can you just talk a little bit about that? It, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a combo of both. Um, the, the industry is beginning to uh, explore the electrification um, and, and it's both companies here in the U.S. and abroad. Um, some of the more specialized pieces of equipment that come from uh, throughout the EU and the U.K. are, are still currently designed to uh, be supported by boiler systems that require natural gas. The industry recognizes that um, the you know throughout the world we're we're looking to to go uh, um, through a, a complete electrification. Are we there yet? Are components of the uh, of the industry there? Slowly, yes. We found some examples, um, but but it's not 
it's it's taking time for for it to fully catch up uh, with with what we're seeing uh, again at the clinical and manufacturing levels. So we're 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 not there yet. Thank you, um, Mr. Edwards. Would you the the feasibility versus cost um, of of electrification? Yeah, I, I certainly would not have uh, more information than the sector has on, on the, the very detailed technical specs of their requirements. I mean, we recognize that when you're talking about uh, traditional HVAC equipment and domestic hot water and lighting, there are technologies that are very efficient and moving, and, and you can electrify those things. For the, we recognize also that for something like the, the, the bio health sector, biotech sector, um, healthcare, um, other technology sectors, that there are probably some processes that, as Mr. Halpert says, are moving in that direction but not, aren't there yet. And so the, I think that's the balance, as you say. The competing priorities we have to figure out is how to support both of those things. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Council Member Balcom. Uh, Mr. Halpert, I just want to pick up on uh, one of the things that you had noted is regarding the facilities and the ability to, uh, to, to uh, transfer uh, electrical capability or just building capacity. You had said it would be easier uh, in green fields, but uh, I don't know if less easy or prohibitive in urban areas. Can you explain that a little bit more? Sure, sure. So we actually looked into this at one of our uh, buildings. Uh, we had a manufacturing building that we were planning to reuse for a clinical organ program. The, the, the physical footprint wasn't available for the added switch gear that's required. Um, likewise, the the upgrade to the power coming in, and we're we're a block and a half uh, down the street from a substation, right on Cameron Street. Uh, probably would have taken about two years and ripping up the streets to do it. Could we do it? Yes. Uh, would we have? Uh, had to take the building offline longer, yes. Would we have to uh, make uh, accommodations um, that would have required uh, permitting, excavation, maybe even putting a whole separate uh, uh, electric building on the adjacent parcel, yes. Could we, could we have done it? Yes. United, as I mentioned, United Therapeutics is a bit of an anomaly, and we, we can make things happen, but um, I, I think we're the exception. Um, but, but it would have been difficult within the existing framework and the existing confines of the building that we had just built three years ago in order to make this happen. I appreciate you uh, expanding upon that a little bit more because clearly what you are hearing and, and uh, appreciate DEP's continued uh, um, uh, listening along with us, right? As we've, this is the third session that we've had. You know, the the goal is clearly to uh, ensure a green climate here uh, in Maryland and in Montgomery County specifically, while also uh, fostering a good environment for these investments and for our jobs and and life sciences sector, uh, specifically related to this conversation. So, um, so I don't have any other questions. Um, so. Just, uh, yes, Just Mr. Edwards. One, one more thought. Um, one of the things I hope the county might be able to do is partner with the life sciences sector to maybe figure out some of these technologies, and maybe we can become the leader in the country on figuring out how to, to increase the energy efficiency of, of this important sector. Because I know they're very interested in it. They've expressed that. And every, every entity we've talked to, whether it's, it's United Therapeutics or AstraZeneca or the hospitals, you know, they all want to reach that goal, and so maybe that's an opportunity for us in this, in this uh, economic and environmental dual things we're trying to meet. You're, you're exactly spot on, and it has to be noted yet again that United Therapeutics is a national and, dare I say, international leader in this space, uh, the largest net zero building uh, on the East Coast here in Montgomery County, uh, leading by example. And clearly there's uh, technology that you can share with, with us and with the rest of the sector. Uh, you're sharing also that it, it didn't come easy and it didn't come cheaply, uh, but it is possible. And, um, you know, uh, I'd also like to note 
the uh, Mr. Halpert, if you want to share with us the decarbonizing biotech facilities, the, the letter or the white paper so that we can have that uh, included into the, the record, the packet. Um, and then also, just so everybody knows, today is the last uh, full t &E committee work session before we dive into the budget uh, through the end of May. And we're going to be taking a pause just like all other uh, council committees are regarding policy and regulatory work. So we'll be uh, hitting the pause button on this. But once we approve the budget, we will be coming back. We will be continuing these, these deep dives into uh, other sectors uh, in, of Montgomery County. Uh, we will be speaking with our uh, commercial sector. We will be speaking with our multifamily residential sector. Uh, we will be speaking with our utilities to understand the feasibility of this as well. And so uh, the conversations will continue. Very much appreciate DEP uh, continued partnership and listening. Uh, and also we'll be looking at the state. And so uh, Mr. Edwards, as those conversations with the state continue, please share with us any information that you might get. Uh, Ms. Schultz, did you have something you wanted to add? It was just on new technologies, and I think one of the important things to consider here, and I, and I appreciate taking an opportunity to look at those different technologies, but all across the state, you know, we're starting to hear about new innovative practices that are occurring for sustainability. The writing is on the wall. People know that this is um, going to be standards, especially since the state law passed in 2022, and I think that there's a lot of information that is coming out of university work and like the uh, Maryland Energy Center, um, just to be able to make sure that those types of innovative practices um, get started here and get utilized here is also one of the main parts of the Maryland Tech Council taking on that um, energy scene as well. So we're happy to be a source for you also when you look at some of those innovative practices that may be coming along. Fantastic. We will definitely uh, utilize your your knowledge and networks as well. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, Ms. Schultz, thank you very much for zooming in with us. Mr. Halpert, thank you for coming up to Rockville and DEP as always. Thank you. The second item on our agenda is a work session on Executive Regulation 124, the incentive program for electric leaf removal equipment as part of our efforts to make our residential neighborhoods greener, cleaner, and quieter. A lot of work at the council side on this. I know a lot of work at DEP as well. And as we work towards the legislative goal of prohibiting the sale of gas powered leaf blowers by July 1st of 2024, just a few months away, uh, and then uh, prohibiting their use entirely by July 1st, 2025, these regulations are going to be very important uh, part of our uh, environmental and equitable uh, uh, use of this uh, of this law and of these new new technologies, um, Mr. Lovchenko, do you have anything you want to add? Um, yeah, just to note that um, the committee had has already um, touched on this issue earlier uh, this uh, this uh, sprint this season uh, with a supplemental appropriation that was approved to um, help initiate the rebate program by July first. Uh, so we had a little bit of discussion about that. Um, but now we have the regulations before us, which provide a little more context for uh, how the rebate program would work. And we do have DEP staff here today that can briefly walk through that. And I've in included in the packet, you know, issues like the time frame, the eligibility for the rebate in terms of residents versus businesses, the amount of the rebate and how that was sort of thought of, uh, the, um, the beginning and end date, things like that. Uh, that I think they could briefly talk about, and I think we can then sort of get through this in a, in a fairly timely manner. Sure. Very good. Um, turn it over uh, to Ms. Stevens. Thank you, and good morning. Good morning. Um, so 
Uh, we really, first off, I want to just start briefly and then I'll turn it over to um, Mary Travellini who can walk us through the regulations in really brief detail. But um, I want to thank you for your support of this leaf, leaf blower incentive program and your interest in advancing these rebates, especially to our um, smaller um, minority owned landscapers. Um, these regulations that are before you today are unchanged from what was discussed in the fall. And um, as you've alluded to, we have a deadline to launch this program by July 1, 2024. And that is less than four months from now. So um, we have a lot of work to get to. Um, we need these regulations passed so that we have the details to guide the rebate program. Um, to, the sooner they're adopted, the sooner we can finalize the development of the program and get, um, get out our outreach program that focuses on the small businesses, on the BIPOC minority businesses, the small landscapers that we're targeting. We really value your work to move this forward and all the work you've done leading up to this effort. Um, and like I said, we have Mary here today who's going to be able to quickly walk through the regulations and then answer any questions that you might have. Fantastic. <coughs> sure. So just to review, of course, we've had meetings with yourselves and your staff as well, and we really appreciate the time you've taken to consider this. And of course, all the previous information that you fed to us from constituents so that we could keep that in mind as we looked at the data and we looked at considerations to what we would put into the executive regulation. Uh, the executive regulation has very is very basic, as basic as possible, but also meant to reach the audiences and populations we have. Uh, and of course, there's all the definitions that are in there and some of the questions that came up about definitions. We're happy to address any of that. But the main parts of the regulation that are really important to us and to the county is that we have this time limited regulation, obviously, that we wish to fund through December of 2026. Uh, so we're looking at a 30 month program. We're aiming to have that in place one year ahead of the regulate or the legislation being passed uh, to ban the use of these. So July 1, we would like to have this ready and in place. Our applications have those three levels where we will have the residential category where they can receive a rebate up to $100 just once throughout the life of the program. There's no belief that residential properties would need an additional uh, rebate in that time period. The landscape community and contractor community that does use leaf blowers may have more than one in their possession may use them heavily throughout that they'll have the opportunity to apply three times once per year within that so they could get up to three and then we have the two qualifying categories the revenue qualifying or the businesses that earn less than 250,000 in a year or have five or fewer employees they're eligible for up to 1500 per rebate and then the non-revenue qualifying would be earning over 250,000 per year and uh, six or more employees in there so those are the three different categories that we have in there. We're, our base rate, um, requirement within the regulation, now we can, of course, do more things within our program administration over time, uh, is that they must have a Montgomery County street address. That is the basis that we have in the regulations. And we will be working with our contractors and the communities as we design this program to see whether or not we would be looking to require any additional information uh, but we have a lot to learn in that sphere. And we did not want to have those types of things within the regulation and box it in where we would not be able to provide these rebates to the folks who need them the most. Uh, thank you for that. Can you, uh, for, for the purpose of this conversation, um, tick through the, uh, the, the rebate amounts for those different, for those, uh, different qualifying, uh, uh, applicants, uh, and then I have some questions on that. So when you say take through amounts, how we determined those amounts or um, review what those amounts are? Review what those amounts okay. are. So for residential, uh, where they are not earning an income off of this, they would be eligible for up to $100 once on their rebate. And then the for the two different business qualifications where they do earn income using their leaf blowers, the revenue qualifying, which is the 250000 or less or under five or fewer employees, they can receive $1,500, up to is the way it's written, up to $1,500 per rebate. And again, they can get one per year, meaning they 
they could, over three years, get three of those $1,500. Now, if they went and they purchased something that was less than $1,500, they are still only going to get whatever that amount is. We're not giving them additional money, of course. Um, and of course, if they purchase something greater than that, they would not get anything greater than that. They would have to pay the difference. And then the revenue qualifying, they get, or the non-revenue qualifying gets $1,000 up to $1,000 three times as well. Great, thank you. Uh, with regard to the, uh, the non-business resident who can get up to $100, uh, that will be per address, I presume? Yes, that is per street address. Now, uh, the question came up, I believe, Councilmember Balcom, you asked this, you know, what if there's an, a multiplication of address because it says we may be able to deny an application if they are applying more than one per address. But let's say the two of you live at the same address, but you earn independent incomes. And Councilmember Balcom uses a leaf blower for her income, and Councilmember Glass, you use a leaf blower for your income. We would inquire. We'd say, okay, Councilmember Glass already got one. We now have an address you know, same address, different name, we're going to inquire with that individual, are you actually an independent income of this other individual at this address to address that challenge? And that would, uh, I, I presume, uh, involve some business receipts or articles of incorporation? Those are great questions. We don't know yet, and we'll be looking towards our contractor for advice on how they've done this in other jurisdictions throughout the country, where some have had higher levels of uh, you know, you need a business card, or if you don't have a business card, give us your, your taxes or whatever it might be. We intend to go as much as possible with the honor system. So before they apply, we want to make sure that people understand that we have these requirements and that it's ju it's not just, hey, everybody, it's free game, you know, type of thing. So we don't know yet what those questions might be. If an individual does apply at that same address, we might go back and say, hey, we already had an application at that address, and so therefore we may need something additional from you, but it's possible that we may have already been requesting that information, and that's not something we've determined yet. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm glad you've thought through that, and we'll be working with the, the contractor to refine it because uh, we don't want uh, households double dipping if a spouse or a child or a parent, mm -hmm. right, are applying, and then uh, some of these show up uh, on eBay or somewhere else, right, uh, neighborhood listserv. Uh, and then uh, the, the other question I have is about the July 1st uh, sale prohibition. What, what does that entail with regard to uh, the retailers in the county and online retailers? Do you know how that works? Great question. Also, we already have the signs up that are required by right, by the legislation in the stores. We've already informed our retailers. We will continue to do outreach to the retailers to inform them. There's actually a limited number of retailers in the county that still sell gas leaf blowers. The majority of them have actually moved to electric leaf blowers already. The online challenge is a little more difficult. I've had a lot of fun with Amazon, uh, and it's it's. I've not yet been able to figure out exactly who to talk to because their response is, uh, and again, this is just Amazon, of course, their response is, well, we hear about, we have people who are watching out for legislation. I said, well, this is not federal legislation about you cannot sell guns online, for example. Uh, so I'm still working through that with Amazon, which is a major retailer. Uh, it's a little bit uh it's a little bit easier with some of our like Lowe's and Home Depots and things to get to the corporate level because we've done that already with the noise law about leaf blowers. So many of those retailers like Ace and Lowe's and Home Depot, our compliance team have worked with them over the years that they no longer sell them within those stores and they can actually do things within zip codes in their online systems where they can eliminate those zip codes. So we'll work with our compliance team to continue to do outreach through those avenues, but it is very difficult to control the online sphere. Yeah, um, I appreciate you sharing uh, the reality on the ground that the larger retailers have already phased out the gas-powered leaf blowers. I'd say that for the people in the back again, right? That they, they have already begun this transition, we are facilitating it, uh, we're, we're revving it up a little bit, uh, but it is already begun. and. Uh, last thing I'll note is uh, with with regard to the online retailers uh, and uh, 
uh, their their team of government affairs professionals who work with them in the different jurisdictions, I would encourage uh, the department to reach out to the Office of Intergovernmental Relations uh, and work with Melanie Wenger and her team once the legislative session in Annapolis ends, because they will know who the Maryland folks for those online retailers are, and they could probably put you in touch with them. Great. Councilmember Balcom. Um, thank you, and um, I apologize for missing the meeting. Uh, I was uh, over ambitious in my scheduling that morning, um, so I appreciate uh, follow up. I sent some questions uh, to the team uh, and uh, got answers back. I appreciate that. Um, so, one of the uh, one of the questions, and and uh, just just to clarify, in case somebody out there has it, it kind of explain to me the process for pre-approval and how that's going to work. So we intend as much as possible to avoid having to issue a check to somebody who may be working in a cash economy or may not be able to get to a bank on time, even though they can cash a county check at any PNC bank, for example, they still may not do that and they're going to have to take it to a check cashing place, which is not only lost revenue for them, it's lost money for the county to just be paying those fees. So our intention is to try to do this through point of sale, which has been done in other jurisdictions. The contractor we have in place has administered that in many places, and our goal is that they don't see any exchange of money, they just see a discounted price on their purchase. And in order to manage this program, which is limited fund-wise, we want to be able to track ahead of time and issue the vouchers out to people so that they walk into the, the place where they're purchasing this with you know, essentially something with a barcode that they are scanning, whether it's from their phone or physically scanning it and getting that discount off of the price. So that is a logistical thing that obviously you would need to pre-apply for. The other is that we want to be able to track the limited funding that we have, right? So we don't, uh, there was a question about, you know, how are we reaching the smaller contractors, the smaller businesses, which is a very important goal for us and outreach is the way that we intend to try to capture that audience the most. But let's say, for example, we decide we're going to take the money that we have for the regulations and, and put them into buckets and say we're going to put a larger bucket to the revenue qualifying businesses, for example. Whether we put them in buckets or not, we need to track how we're doing as we go along the way. So as people are applying, okay, it's not very popular. Maybe our outreach isn't working very well. Maybe we need to go more towards paying for these radio ads because that seemed to boost people or maybe it's so popular that we're trying to struggle with who is applying and and how many do we have left and oh my goodness the money's all gone for the first year in the first three months. So if we don't have an application process in place ahead of time, we don't know where our money is. And then people may think that they can get something and they're they're applying thinking, oh, my thing just died or I'm ready now or, I've, you know, the deadline's coming up. And we are saying, sorry, you just, we don't have any money left, right? So there's multiple facets to why we want to have that pre-approval. Okay. Thank you. I uh, appreciate that. And, and I think that that... Pre-approval um, needs to be very upfront in all of your uh, marketing campaigns, so people don't come back asking for their for their money after they've um, purchased something with a receipt or something like that. So I think that's important. Um, and I still, uh, I mean, one of my issues has been all along that the uh, communication to the people who will need this rebate the the most. And so I think that that's, um, I do, I do want to make sure that as you're going along and looking at who's getting this money, that can we have some kind of a, a pause mechanism? So, for instance, you open the, because you're, you're, on day one, anyone is eligible, correct? So it would be very important at, at the end of the summer, for instance, going into fall, which, um, you know, it's a hot time for leaf blowers, um, that we look at who's, who's received this money. And um, so what, are, are you considering then pausing or changing, or how would that work if, you know, we get to September and the vast majority of people who got money are uh, larger companies. 
Yeah, so we we determined this will be a learning experience, and we can we will have an online portal that our IT team is working on that we can pause like we do with our Rainscapes program, and we can also say we learned things in the first three months, six months, one year. What will we do differently in the next year? And we may have windows of times where we're learning that this is when people are making the purchases, and so therefore we're going to do that because it's not just the lead up to this coming fall, but it's the lead up to the change in the law the next. July. So there will be a lot of folks possibly scrambling, even though we'll be doing a lot of outreach. Oh my gosh, this deadline's coming up. I heard about it, but now it's actually happening. Uh, and then we also expect that there will be a point at which we might see a fair number of concerns or complaints coming in from businesses and residents about noise complaints, right? And then we're doing outreach and saying, hey, we have a rebate program for you. It's Part of the outreach, but if we don't have the rebate available, obviously we want our compliance team to not, you know, spread that word. So there will be a lot of learning and shifting, but yes, we can pause it at any time based on funding, and we can also look for other sources of funding if it's extremely popular and uh, really going down. And also, this regulation says up to. Right, so we might say, okay, it was up to fifteen hundred, but maybe at some point we're advertising we have smaller rebates to you know to try to reach more people. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And then uh, I th I still think that there's the the initial marketing to let people know that the law has passed in the first place. Um, and I think that I've said before, I think that uh, many people will find out. Um, you know, two years from now, three years from now, when they when there's a complaint filed against them, uh, and it, it will be the first time that they've even know that that's happening. So I think that that, and and we can all help the, uh, fr from the perspective of the council can help push it out to our um, our constituents, and then you have a geographic dispersion of the information. So please um, continue to keep us in the loop on that. So um, and thank you. Picking up on, on the point that Councilmember Balcom just made about the public outreach and, and awareness, we haven't touched on that here. So can you uh, share with us what those thoughts are or what your plan is uh, to notify not only residents but some of the small uh, minority-owned contractors? Absolutely. Uh, we have a really fantastic contractor who has worked on many initiatives in the county, including the pesticide law. And we, very, you know, first conversations with, with them were about reaching these audiences and doing a lot more unique outreach mechanisms, not just about the rebate program, but about, about the law the, itself. And some of the discussions also are around timelines of when you reach out to people. So we have to consider all of our audiences in Montgomery County and that we need to, you know, be writing and speaking to the, the fifth grade reading audience so that we can reach everyone and also do that in multiple languages, which just adds that layer of complexity complexity. Uh, we don't want to speak too much about the change in law before this July 1st because we don't want confusion that we're going to start getting complaints and confusion that I heard July 1 and then they are complaining in the summer to our compliance staff or to other people. You know, this yeah, it, ha it will happen anyway. Uh, but we, after July 1, we'll be able to do a lot more where we're able to say law coming, right? And there will be times where we will be talking about the law in conjunction with the rebates and times where we'll be talking about the rebates alone. So just to give examples, some of the conversations around our outreach is that we may only do do radio ads in Spanish, right? So some things we might do in English and Spanish and Amharic um, and all sorts of languages, but we might say, hey, radio ads in Spanish, and maybe that radio ad might say, are you a solo landscaper? Are you an independent landscaper? Do you earn less than $50,000 a year landscaping, right? So even though they can qualify up to 250000 we are going to look at tactics within reaching to the smallest of the smallest businesses when we do that. And when it comes to, obviously, outreach on the law, that's where we, we will do blanket outreach all over, you know, with mailers and, and reaching every household and every business. But with the rebate program, there may be times where we say, hey, you know, we're going to target this audience in this way and not do it in another language or in another way. Uh, uh, as uh, Councilmember Balcom noted in, in her questions and comments, uh, and as you will remember, during the nearly year and a half, we had this conversation at the council stemming the uh, 
bridging from the last council to this council, uh, most of the conversation was focused on the outreach and making sure that it can be implemented and can be done fairly and equitably. And uh, it sounds like uh, there's a good concept in place right now. So, uh, so I, I'm supportive of of these regulations, Councilmember Balcom. Yes, thank you. Great. So, uh, so that is unanimous among the two of us, and. Uh, we'll bring this to full council uh, as soon as we can so that you all can continue getting to work and we'll meet the July 1st, first benchmark. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, DEP. And now the third item on our agenda today is uh, a final recap, our fourth conversation on the uh, FY25 to 30 capital improvements program for transportation, pedestrian facilities, bikeways, and roads. We have had three very good conversations, tough conversations, and I know they're only going to get tougher as we start meeting with all of our colleagues uh, and try to reconcile the different priorities, particularly those here at T&E and those at the Education and Culture Committee, uh, the two committees with the largest uh, stake in the CIP, um, and want to welcome uh, Chair Harris to the conversation because I know that uh, Parks and Planning has some thoughts uh, here as well, but I'll turn it over to Mr. Kenny to tee us up. Sure. So quickly, uh, before getting to the presentation from the Planning Board, we just have two um, outstanding projects that this committee has not issued a formal recommendation on. Um, just run through them. Um, the first being Observation Drive Extended. Um, so the committee reviewed this project during its work session last week, March 11th. Uh, but at that time, um, given that we knew that DOT would be sending over an, an updated project form for this for this project with additional information, this committee decided to defer that discussion to today. Uh, we have that additional information now, um, and it reflects uh, an additional one-year delay uh, in this project, uh, in the, these project expenditures uh, beyond what was recommended previously um, from the county executive. Um, that F, that uh, is reflected in the table in the packet, the FY25 to 30 CE recommended. Um, you'll see the, the bulk of the project funds are still out beyond six years, um, but it's just that the, the, the funding that was in the project for within the six years has been delayed by an additional year. Um, and I'll turn it over to DOT to um, elaborate further. Director Conkling. Thank you. I think that's as we expected in the last time we discussed this, that we talked about the ongoing master planning activity and there being interest in the two landowners that are affected by this project and the location of the project. So this delay allows those uh, items to play themselves out with the planning board's process to figure out what the recommended alignment should be. Councilman, welcome. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> I apologize. I thought we decided that oh. last time. <laughs> um, so I, I agree with that. Yeah, and and yeah. so uh, I don't know if it was if if it was said today, but just to be even more clear, uh, this is uh, continuing our commitment to the project, but understanding the alignment might change based on uh, the landowners, the property owners' decisions. Correct. That's correct. Yes. Okay. Right. Yeah, and th thank you for saying that. I, I think it's it's clear that the project is desperately needed, uh, it's just that uh, the alignment may change. So thank you. Great. So we will uh, support that. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and then the last one is uh, state transportation participation. Um, this was not included in uh, previous packets because it does not have any expenditures within the six-year period. Um, this project is complete. Um, but uh, DOT did, did want me to note that there is uh, a $2.2 million decrease in total project costs um, due to uncertainty on whether the county will be billed by the state for certain sub-projects of this project. 
Um, so this is this will not affect the expenditures within this CIP, but is of note for the committee. And I'll turn it over again to DOT to to elaborate. Sure, we haven't had a lot of discussion of this project in recent years. It's been around for a long time, and there were a lot of large projects that uh, this project supported the funding of, the Watkins Mill Interchange, the first phase of uh, Montrose Parkway, the Brookville Bypass, and others. There's one active project remaining, which is the addition of a left turn lane from 355 north to west Old Baltimore Road in Clarksburg. The construction activity has been complete on that project for a while, but we're still not certain what the final closeout billings were. There's some cost sharing in the agreement with the state, and we haven't received state bills for that. So we're, we're proposing to eliminate some of the reserves that were held in this project because we were uncertain about whether the bike path components were going to be built as part of the project or not. They've been implemented largely by the adjacent landowner as part of the redevelopment of the property. So that risk has left this project, um, and we're retaining some funds to pay the state invoices. There is some chance that we'll be surprised by the state billing and need to come back and add some funds to cover close out of that project, but we don't expect to. And thought given the pressures on the CIP, it was prudent to reduce that funding now and address that need if it came forth at a later time. And one more time, uh, because it's not uh, detailed uh, in the packet, it is for the left turn signal at Old Baltimore. In, uh, there was about a thirteen million dollar project to add a left turn lane from yep. three fifty five to West Old Baltimore Road. A lot of storm water and stream culvert replacement and a traffic signal were built at that location. It's been complete for a year or more, but the billing has not caught up to the to the project. The project was completed in September two thousand twenty. Okay. Uh, and that is independent of the need to widen. Uh, that that stretch of 355 as well, right? Correct. There were two projects that were implemented there. There were some improvements at Brink Road that were implemented as part of developer mitigation, and this project that was implemented as a county, state, and developer cost share project. But there are other needs in that quarter that this doesn't necessarily address. Great. Great. District Council Member and I agree. Great. All right. Well, that wraps up. Um, the outstanding projects that we have to consider. Um, this committee will hear again from uh, on some of these CIP projects for which the executive has transmitted amendments. Um, but rather than you know do a, qu a quick turnaround for that in this work session, we'll um, find dates um, in in the near future to take that on. Great. And and I I, I know that Chair Harris um, wanted to convey some projects that the the planning board views as. As priorities, and so while we are, uh, you know, uh, setting the scene late in the in 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 the the timeline already, I wanted to provide him with a venue to share uh, to share their prerogatives uh, and and seek our input. Great, great. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Chair Glass and Councilmember Balcom, uh, Artie Harris, uh, Planning Board Director. For the record. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to detail the planning board's recommendations around the fiscal year 2530 CIP budget on transportation. Per the request of council staff, we're going to focus on three recommendations that were important to us. The Montgomery Village Bikeway, bicycle parking in the Aspen Hill pedestrian priority area. I'm going to turn it over to Steve Aldrich to go over those details on those three potential projects. Hi, Steve Aldrich, Planning Department. Um, so the, and I think we have a presentation to go with this. We are working on that. Okay. Um, so the first project uh, I wanted to talk about was Montgomery Village Avenue Bikeway. Um, this was a project that was identified in the biennial mon monitoring report for the bicycle master plan, as well as in our July uh, uh, planning board's letter on transportation priorities. Um, so as, as we looked at um, the implementation of bicycle connectivity across the county, what we, we, we realized in the last couple of years is that the attention to addressing equity hasn't really progressed as, as well in this area. So we identified, um, and, and in fact we did this last year, identified several projects that we thought would be great candidates for expanding the bike network and really, really, uh, you know, sort of a, attaching on opportunities and I think Montgomery Village Avenue is a great op opportunity with the redevelopment of Lake Forest Mall 
um, you know, this would be a project that would extend from the city of Gaithersburg limits potentially all the way up to Whiteman, but it could be any, you know, any, any connective distance to, to make a difference. Um, and it certainly should be considered as, as we move forward as a project to advance. Um, Mr. Kenny, are we able to get, we're having some issues with connecting to the, uh, network for whatever reason I'm okay. in touch with it is great um, so uh, mr. Aldrich if I, uh, I could just stop on that one we can discuss that uh, in detail uh, so it's on Montgomery Village Avenue is it a dedicated lane is it adjacent to the road it essentially is a, a master plan side path to connect um, I believe it might be on the east side of the road um, there are sections of that road that actually have a pretty nice side, side path, but it's having a connective continuous facility um, to, to connect folks from the Montgomery Village area down towards the city of, Ga of Gaithersburg. And uh, as noted uh, in the information that we have, uh, I understand the, the concept to provide the synergy, right, uh, uh, with, with the redevelopment at Lake Forest Mall. Where is that in its, uh, I know the city of Gaithersburg approved a, a very ambitious plan. Do you know how long that will take? I, I couldn't speak to that, I'm sorry. Okay. That's where welcome right now. <laughs> um, so the, the, the plan is going through the process okay. at, at the city of Gaithersburg. And of course it's uh, very much market driven. So um, it, it'll, uh, it'll take a while, I, I would assume. And different pieces may come online. Um, I, when I saw this, I was very happy to see this. Um, the the re, uh, redevelopment of the Lake Forest Mall property is going to transform that area. Presumably, hopefully, mm -hmm. it will transform that area. And the, uh, the area of Montgomery Village uh, will be, is, has been very involved in that process. And the assets that will take place, the community assets that will happen at Lake Forest Mall uh, will, will be very much um, used and owned by the Montgomery Village uh, from that perspective of um, that synergy. So I think this is really important. And as you said, there, is, there, there are trails that, that kind of abut the Montgomery Village Avenue. Uh, and, and, and they don't go anywhere uh, to, to meet uh, other areas. So I think this is a really important project, um, and I was very happy to see it. And what's the estimated project cost? That one I think I can speak to as well. Okay. Okay. Uh, you want to talk about the second item? Sure. The second item is the recommendation for funding a bicycle parking station at the Glenmont Metro Rail Station. Um, Glenmont being at the end of the red line, um, it's really sort of missing out an opportunity to tap into the bicycle to, to transit market. Um, and while there are some facilities there, it, it's just not, it's not adequate and the percentage of folks who actually use bicycle to Metro is, is very low based on, on surveys that have been conducted. And so does, uh, I think you just noted that the Glenmont Metro station does have Bicycle parking facilities, you're just recommending more? More, yes. Okay. Yep. That seems self-evident. Uh, and then what is the, the third project? The third project is, um, is that the request was for a, um, a new project to implement the safety recommendations in the Aspen Hill Vision Zero study. This was a study done by the planning department, um, started back in 2018. Um, and it was really part of our, um, our efforts to contribute to the Vision Zero focus. Um, there were a lot of um, um, some, some, I would say, fairly scary to the residents. Uh, crashes that occurred, especially on Georgia, one bus stop actually got taken totally out. Uh, and so uh, the planning department spent some time doing uh, quite a lot of meetings and, and you know, worked to put together a study to say what, what things could be done. And, that study pointed out a lot of great things that the county is already doing in that area, including the Hawk Signal that, that was, I think, believe up by that time. Uh, but, you know, the, the, I think part of the focus was uh, we had seen other uh, BIPA projects where they had focused PDF projects, like the Purple Line and Wheaton, et cetera. Um, and we felt like this was an area that needed that type of attention. 
Um, so we made that recommendation. Um, I think we, we also realized that um, there is a general BIPA fund. Um, currently, I'm not sure how much of that current project is being allocated towards Aspen Hill. So one alternative request could just be, please move Aspen Hill up in terms of the focus of that project. I absolutely agree that that stretch of Georgia Avenue um, from from Glenmont up to you know Leisure World, and one could even argue uh, past that, but particularly uh, from from the Glenmont Metro Station uh, uh, up through uh, the the main shopping area. I mean that that is one of the most dangerous stretches of roads in all of Montgomery County, and I have attended uh, far too many community walks and vigils uh, for individuals and married couples um, who have died there, um, having attended with their kids. Uh, and so I, I know uh, the need needs no explanation, right? Um, and so, so I, I get that. Let me, let me just take a step back and, and ask the bigger picture. Why are these three projects being presented now, and why were they not incorporated with the Department of Transportation's projects? Well, I know that we, um, with the exception of the bike parking, the other two projects were included in the planning board's review last July, mm -hmm. um, and they were pretty high up on the list of priorities. I think, um, I think to your comment, I think one of the things that um, we could be a little better at on the planning department side is um, advocating between agencies um, and pushing the agenda more. Uh, so, so what I'm hearing is, is you, you requested it, and it was an executive decision not to include it. Yeah. Uh, and we do meet on a regular basis. And, I, and I, I, well, I think that we, um, we have, um, we have uh, priorities or things that went, we identify which, uh, you know, from the, we're, we're trying to basically um, help the planning board advance certain agendas. And I think that, that we... Um, we meet with a regular basis, and we, we probably don't push it enough. You know, I, I think if we could basically say, "Hey, could you put put you know put more effort into advancing it?" Yeah, you you don't need to explain it anymore, right? The the basis um, is that you included it, you asked for it, it wasn't included. Director Conklin, can you? Yeah, I just first like us? to say that the three priorities that have been expressed here are all worthy things for the county to do. So it's a question of what fits within the resources that we have available. And there are items that were already prioritized in our work plan that aren't funded. So the Glenmont BIPA is an item that we would like to begin working on too, but it's not in the available resources. So we weren't able to find the capacity to start these new efforts given that we were already curtailing other projects that had been in the CIP for a long time. And while these are all good, they may not be the next in the list that we had uh, to get funding should it become available. So that's that's basically what's going on with these two issues. Understood. And then uh, because of the process, is that why there's no project cost associated with them? That's right. correct. Okay. Um, thank you. Just for a process question. Um, so what about projects that are in the CIP but with no dollars in the six year? They're all, the dollars are put out, you know, post six years. Uh, how do those projects come online? I'm not sure any project has started that way. Oh. <laughs> I, th I think, I don't think we've ever introduced a project into the CIP that didn't have funding in the six years when it was first introduced. I might not be right about that, but it doesn't jog Generally a bell so. with me. Generally, that happens when the project enters, the fiscal capacity is limited in a future year, and then it's delayed. Got it. And then oftentimes, as we've talked about, they stay in that position for quite a long time. And there's usually an effort to advance those projects before entering new ones, not always, but usually. So for example, a Dale Drive project came in and has moved past some of those projects that have always been beyond six years because the merits of that project appeared stronger and there was more constituency for that than some of the projects that had been there before. That's generally the dynamic around that. And if there were constituency and desire for these, it's possible that they could leapfrog other projects that haven't been funded or were funded and then that funding got delayed beyond six years. and. In the amendments we sent over, we proposed eliminating one of those projects that's been around for a really, really long time and never moved forward. Mm -hmm. And that would create a little less competition for 
introducing new projects that may have a more, more relevance in the current time or have a constituency that's more active or more value related to the current priorities of the council and executive. Okay, thank you. That makes sense. Uh, and what is the process for uh, determining uh, cost estimates for any of these three projects? There have been traditionally three different methods. One is, and I'm going to say this, and I'm trying not, I'm not trying to be offensive, but in this process, council staff will take a guess at what the project cost is and add it. That has caused some significant problems as those projects actually get designed, so I don't recommend that. The other two methods have been the facility planning process, which you'll hear more about in an OLO briefing to council that I think is in early April. Um, that's a relatively long and exhaustive alternatives development process that generally takes a lot of time and money to do. The third method that these get added is through the Transportation Feasibilities Program, which was a new project added to the CIP, I think, two cycles ago, um, which has a level of effort funding of $250,000. If we wanted to do more feasibility studies, then we need to have more resources in that. But items like, um, I don't think, we probably don't need a lot to study bike parking at the Glenmont Metro, uh, but items like the Montgomery Village Bikeway might take, you know, a quarter to a half a million dollars to understand what the order magnitude needs of that quarter are and how they could be addressed. That project might be viable for facility planning, but again, that's going to be a multi-year effort that may be an over allocation of resources to just figure out what we would need to do to create a better facility in a location where we know where that location is. We know that there's not a lot of opportunity for different alternatives. That might be something that could be accomplished with, you know, a hundred to three hundred thousand dollars of effort, which would expand the need in that facility planning, or not facility planning, transportation feasibility study program if you wanted to explore that project. I would not recommend establishing it as a standalone project without having done some Evalu evaluation work ahead of time. Uh, I, I agree with that, um, and I agree that um, staff should should not be throwing a dart right mm -hmm. at a dartboard, guessing at, at what the, the the cost should be. But it uh, it seems to me that the Glenmont Metro Rail Station uh, bicycle parking is the most manageable, most you know, most clear cut of these projects. Could that be incorporated in a future BIPA conversation or uh, amendments to the CIP in the next? Good, and we have two efforts like this underway now at Bethesda and Silver Spring that were federal grant funded, and we funded other bike parking work like this through the Bikeways Minor Program. If the council wanted to consider adding this to the project description and some funding to advance this as part of that program, that would be right. viable. Clearly, we're trying to navigate and figure out how we can accomplish these goals that we, I, I think we all agree, as, as even Director Conklin, you noted, they're all uh, in, worthy whether or not they fit in, in the executive's uh, ranking is, is the question here. But glad to know that at least within the BIPA conversation, we, we, can, we can do that. Chair Harris. Yep. Uh, great, great questions. I, I, Steve and I were talking about costs. Uh, last week when we were talking about these projects and who comes up with the estimates. But what we also talked about was meeting with your group early on, early on in the budget process to talk about our priorities and, and, and seeing if we could maybe come to a, some of a meeting of minds beforehand. We may not be able to, but at least you know what we're thinking about. And so our goal is to tr start doing that uh, before the earlier in the part of, part of the challenge is early on. Yeah, early. A lot earlier. I know, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one of the things that, you know, we do our, um, our biennial review of transportation priorities for the, for the planning board. Um, typically, we've done that in the summer, and it appears that we actually need to move that back a couple months because the budget cycle never starts too early. So uh, the next time we do it next year, we'll, we'll probably be starting the, the work in April and, you know, getting the letter submitted by probably early May. Sure. Yeah. So uh, I'm glad we've, you know, uh, found a reasonable solution moving forward and, and has to be stated last year was a year of transition uh, at planning and there were a lot of other things that were being worked on. Uh, and so understandably this uh, was not at the top of the list, but uh, I know that you will communicate and that you'll uh, communicate sooner so that when we take up amendments or in the next few years um, take up the full CIP, we can incorporate some of these in. Uh, and circling back to the Glenmont Metro Rail Station, figure out other ways through the budget that we can accomplish those goals.
I wanted to differentiate between the bike parking and BIPA at Aspen Hill. Those are sure. very different levels of effort. We're pretty much at our limit and able to manage BIPAs with the current staff assigned to that. So if we're going to expand the BIPA pool, we probably want to consider adding an engineer or planner position to support the BIPA activity in addition to whatever other resources added to that program. I don't know. And, and Glemon is not a, a designated BIPA, correct? It is, but it's not currently being worked on. There's a list of designated BIPAs. Only some of them are in active work. Just a couple, just a couple questions about the, the specific to the, each of these projects. So the process that you're talking about, the fees, the, um, the the beginning, looking at the feasibility and trying to come up with the cost, is that when you would look at whether there would state funds available for the project? It would be an opportunity for us to start doing that. We're usually looking at the physical needs and viability of the project, mm -hmm. uh, identify a project cost and. It's a relatively new program, so we haven't got that far into evaluating funding opportunities, but that could be something we look at. Okay, thanks. Most of the funding opportunities have come before the project was defined in the last two cycles. So somebody said, I want to fund this, and then we try to tailor the work program to the funding that was provided. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. And then the, uh, the Glenmont uh, station, uh, going back to the prior um, discussion about the tunnel, is the t does the tunnel have bicycle a bicycle path? The pedestrian tunnel, which the existed the, the, Glen the Glen Glen to Glenmont Metro. So that's Forest Glen. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Great, it's thanks. Glenmont too, but it's there. Okay, thanks. Great. Uh, thank you, right? Seeing how things happen and letting folks know that when they uh, email us uh, in the middle of the CIP asking for requests. Uh, we we want to hear them. We want to learn about the projects that are of importance, but that we, we need to start the process a little earlier. Uh, so we'll continue working on this. Um, clearly, there's uh, there's no funding. Uh, there's no cost associated with these, so there's nothing that we can move forward, um, not to mention that we are nearly uh, back of the envelope estimate, a quarter of a billion dollars that we need to close. I think with the priorities that the council, uh, that the committee has at least said we'd like to reinstate with, with regard to uh, this budget. So capacity is, is not there as well, but um, let's continue talking and figuring out other ways that we can make some of these happen in the short term. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Kenny, anything else? Nothing further. Great. Thank you. Uh, next steps on the CIP is uh, we'll start getting debriefed at full council, uh, and then we'll start trying to reconcile all of these different needs. And so with that, this committee is adjourned. Thank you.